hate. No, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. And even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And though you bring me choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll like a river. Let righteousness flow like a never-failing stream. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come before me, who has asked this of you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense are detestable to me. Your new moons and sabbaths and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your pointed festivals I hate with all of my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and clean yourselves. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. This probably isn't the light Thursday Devo that you were expecting, is it? I'm sorry. <laughs> but hopefully this is obvious that these words aren't my own. In fact, these words come from the Bible. They come from God himself. And I think... The hardest thing about these words is the fact that they aren't even written to his enemies. They're written to his chosen people. Now, there's probably, there might even be a chance that you didn't even know that these words existed in our Bibles. And to be honest, these words are probably pretty confusing to a lot of us. Because when we skim through these passages uh, and look over what God says he hates, he says this, he hates Israel's Festivals, their assemblies and gatherings, their burnt offerings and grain offerings, their fellowship offerings. He says he hates their musical worship and their Sabbaths and their convocations, which is just a word for the gathering of Jews to read aloud from the Torah and the prophets. In other words, it was gatherings of God's people to read aloud from God's word. God even goes as far to say that in Isaiah 150, he's not listening to his people's relentless prayers. I think there's one thing that should be clear. This needs to be scary to us. This should terrify us. Because of all of these things, all of the things from this list, they're not only good things, but they are literally commanded of the Israelites by God himself. These are normal, rhythmic forms of worship for God's people, and God designed it to be that way. So what's going on? What's going on here? Why is God so angry? Why is he taking it out on his people? What have they even done other than what he has commanded them to do? Where is God's abounding patience? How can God talk like this? Can a loving God even talk like this? Well, these are honest questions and they're good ones to ask. Because once we ask them, we can move forward and look at what God has to say about it. Because he hasn't left us in the dust. See, at the end, the conclusion of the Amos 5 passage we read, God gives us his reasoning. He says, Instead, let justice roll like a river. Let righteousness flow like a never-failing stream. Or at the end of Isaiah 1, he says, Wash yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight and stop doing wrong. Learn to do what is right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. You see, at the end of these poems, these words from God, we see that he is so concerned with the, with the health, the care, and the attention towards the vulnerable people of Israel's society that he says it's impossible for him to be pleased with them as they go about their weekly rhythms of worship as long as they continue ignoring their neighbors. 
Every human being has been made in the image of God, which means that every human being is valuable and deserving of dignity. We absolutely love to hear that Jesus is willing to leave the 99 to chase after the one when the one is us. But I think sometimes we become uncomfortable when the focus is on someone else that we can't relate to or that we don't act like or that we don't even think like. I thought Christianity was all about my personal relationship with Jesus. Not about anyone else, not about justice, but a personal relationship, right? Well, you see, when we have a relationship with God, we have no choice but to care for the vulnerable populations of our society. Throughout the whole Old Testament, God actually made laws so that the Israelites would have to care for the vulnerable people of their society. And when he did so, he reminded the Israelites that they were in a position of power, a position of privilege, and that they needed to remember that they too once needed rescue, that they were once slaves in Egypt, and God provided for them by taking up the cause of the oppressed. So they too should take up this mantle and care for the vulnerable and the oppressed in their society. So what do these words mean for us today? What do they mean for you specifically? Well, to be honest, it's going to look a little bit different for each one of us. But isn't it true that throughout human history, throughout wars and pandemics and plagues, and throughout other crises, it's pretty much standard that those who are going to suffer the most are those who are already vulnerable, right? Like this is why when COVID-19 hit, the elderly and the sick were most at risk. This is why when the stay-at-home orders were released, the blue-collar workforce were the most concerned. This is why when Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd were murdered, our black brothers and sisters wept and wailed the loudest. This is why when the riots started, the smallest business owners became the most terrified. Don't be mistaken. Injustice happens all around us. The vulnerable are always at risk. But what we should read from these verses in Isaiah and Amos is that we cannot go about our rhythms of worship like nothing happened. We need to take up the cause of the vulnerable. In fact, this is why I'm so proud of our church. Because what I know to be absolutely true is this. Our elders care about the vulnerable. Our church loves their neighbors. Our congregants fear the Lord and are unwilling to engage in empty worship without giving thought or taking action towards towards caring for our vulnerable. So as we go about our week, as we go about today even, let's ask God that he would open our eyes to the vulnerable so that we can give thought to the oppressed around us. See, our world is hurting. Our nation is hurting. Our state is hurting, and our city is hurting. And if we ever get to a point in our church where we say that the vulnerable should take care of themselves, then it's probably the day we should close our doors. But instead, as Isaiah says, we will pursue justice, correct the oppressor, defend the rights of the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. Or as James says in our New Testament, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep one's, oneself unstained from the world. So let's seek out opportunities to care for the vulnerable populations around us because the day that we convince ourselves that they don't exist is the day we've closed our eyes. I think this is what Jesus means when he says that we should love our neighbor as ourself. It's the idea of taking on other people's problems as our own. Or to quote from the prophet Micah, God has told you what is good. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God.